Uh, our guest tonight is the club's national recruiting manager, Jason Taylor, who has just completed his fifth draft for the Demons after crossing over from Collingwood in the early part of 2013. Uh, Jason, thanks very much for giving up your time to join us on the Demonland podcast tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure, Jason. Jason, we won't congratulate you just yet uh, for this year's draft selections. Uh, we'll wait to see how they pan out uh, in a few years' time, but uh, how do you and the team feel at the end of the whole uh, trade and draft period? Yeah, no, we were quite content. Um, yeah, and that's not to say that, like, like you just said then, Andy, it's, um, you know, it, it's all got to play out, but obviously we've done a lot of work on those players over a number of years, and, um, you know, we feel that we got a good good mix of player that have made of the right stuff and um, so we feel pretty content right now and um, we're confident they'll give it their best shot and obviously through the trade period uh, it's able to bring in Jay Cleaver was a real um, uh, strong acquisition for the club and a, um, you know, a player of need and um, a player of great character and um, we're, we're wrapped to get him and also the addition of Harley Bellick as well which has some real more depth to our midfield so Jake Lee is obviously overall. one player um, uh, who is, you know, a walk-up start and will be in the best 22. Who among the rest of the draftees uh, and Harley might surprise and get games early in 2018, much like Mitch Hannon did this year? Yeah, look, I think that um, Harrison Petty is a key defender. He's a young fellow. He's fairly light. Will, will, will need to be nurtured and take some time. Um, and also Charlie Spargo's coming off the shoulder, but he's, he's um, not too far away. But he, he's certainly got a chance, Charlie, I think, back in the year, middle of the year. I mean, who, who knows? But I think the the main two is probably Bailey Fritz, given that he's, you know, he's been able to put together a pretty um, strong year at VFL level already. Um, and also Oscar Baker, who's played some senior football. They're probably the two, Fritz and Baker, that, that may, may uh, get opportunities at some stage. Uh, there was uh, talk about West Coast uh, being into Bailey Fritch. Uh, were we always drafting him at 31, or was there was that to trump the uh, Eagles at 32? Um, it's been noted by a few Demon Landers that uh, West Coast took a bit of time after our picks. So, um, yeah, the thought was that West Coast were into him at 32. No, nah, he was the very next player on our list. But, I mean, at times you try and work through and gather some intel um, if your picks are close enough together, 31, 36, probably a little bit far apart to be um, getting too cute with that. So we're, he was just the next player on our list, so we, we called him out at 31. How much um, how much strategising goes into... How much second-guessing do you have to do um, around the clubs around you um, uh, and, yeah, and sort of preparing um, for the different eventualities? Yeah. You get a feel for what clubs might do, but I, I, I'm not just play, towing the party line as such, I suppose. It's that you actually do just have your order and you mark them off accordingly. You might have scenarios which might play out with later picks as far as positional types and how you've gone earlier. But um, it sounds simple to say that we just um, tick them off on our order, but clearly there's a lot of work that goes into that order. Yep. Uh, the decision to not replace Jake Spencer um, with another ruck is being seen by uh, some supporters as a bit of a gamble given our injury toll in, in that uh, department this year. Are we crossing our fingers that Gorn, McDonald and, and then Peterson as a backup can stay fit or are we hoping that, uh, um, that King and the flipper will come on sooner rather than later? Oh, I think it's a little bit uh, a mixture of of all that, like, you know, like Maxie's in um, really good nick at the moment. You, you know, you, you hope that your number one ruckman stays fit and can yep. play out the year. And uh, as we saw last year, that wasn't quite the case. And that that void was filled, you know, by Pedersen and, and, and Tom McDonald at times, Watts. Um, but we feel that, you know, with with that group, you've got Gorney, the guys I've mentioned, uh, Tommy McDonald, uh, Pedo, and also Sam Wiedemann, who rucked a fair bit as a junior. Now, again, he goes in the young bracket with King and Philip Hovick. But um, King, King's had a, had a strong pre-season to date. Um, he started to gather a bit of momentum last year, and we just feel that, um, you know, in time, the setup of our, our rucks is, is OK at the moment. Um, 
and we didn't feel a need to bring in a player um, that would potentially not play at senior level as backup and then play at Casey and then there's no development league anymore. Um, yep. So all that stuff is part of our thinking like that. Mitch King doesn't develop and Flipper doesn't develop and because they're not getting the game time. Um, so we're just going to back in um, that, you know, we'll, it's not luck, but we, you know, we want to get some games into Mitch and, and, and Lachlan as well. Yep, fair call. Um, can you briefly take us through the process a bit? Um, how big is the network of talent scouts that you rely on throughout the country? Um, how many games do you personally see live and, or on tape each week? And uh, how long do you track a player ahead of a draft? Uh, is it two, three years or maybe more? Yeah, I think there's some good cases out of this year's lot. That, so Charlie Spargo, you track from you know the under-16 nationals um, and you track his progress from there. Bailey Fritz, 2015 at Casey, we looked at him potentially as a rook again, 2016. Um, he just had some issues with his body, so we, we weren't quite sure of the durability side of it there, but he's been able to put that together. And so, I mean, there's a three-year period there. Um, so uh, it's, it's, I'd, I'd say collectively it's a three-year period, but with, say, Oscar Baker, he only come onto the scene early, early at the start of this year. Um, just circumstances, he grew late um, and, you know, he started to play some good footy in the national and we threw Maxie Rook, who knew a coach of his, that um, he said, you know, he might be worth a look. So uh, the whole football club's a network as such. Now, as far as our scouts around the country, I mean, they're critical to our process. They're, we've got a fantastic group of um, scouts, just, just excellent blokes who work hard and have a real passion for not only their craft, but the footy club. Um, so we've got about seven, I think, in Victoria. Um, and we've got uh, two in um, South Australia. At times, we've had three. And we've got um, two in WA. At times, we've had three. Um, had a, a, f- a fellow by the name of Mark Krug in Queensland and a guy in uh, the Northern Territory who, who covers a bit of NAFL for us um, as well. So, And then, obviously, there's the full-time team with... Um, who do an outstanding job in Tim Lamb and Darren Fruger, um, and Kelly O'Donnell is our pro scout who, who crosses over and, and, and he doesn't norm a power of work really towards the end of the year on vision and whatnot. But as far as games live, like, you know, you start watching games in February and early Feb, really. We have a break in January, start watching games again in early Feb. Uh, that's state trials start up. Um, so we, we get to those and then, um, I think it averages out at about, oh, you know, really four games a weekend. It can be more, occasionally less, depending on your travel. Um, and then we catch up on the vision of the games that we weren't at throughout the week, as well as writing our reports and, and having our meetings, which are to capture what's gone before from the weekend. So that's, you know, Tim and Darren will talk to all the scouts throughout the country and collect all that information and we bring that together on a, um, a Tuesday morning and we go through um, each each player of interest. So obviously there's an enormous amount to start with and uh, so nothing falls through the cracks that way as far as our next week's planning goes. So next week's planning is like, OK, we need to make sure that we get on top of this player now, you know. So, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much the process um, that we undertake for the season when the games are on. Is, is it a case of uh, drafting uh, best available or according to needs? Um, is it a combination of both or does it change from season to season depending on the circumstances? And, and who has the final say ultimately? Is it you or is it Simon in the end? Yeah, no, I think there is a, there's got to be some flexibility around need. Otherwise, you just keep bringing in midfielders, you know, really, ultimately. Um, so you've got to have a bit of creativity around that, but you can't really, um, if there's an absolute, you know, jet that you pick, you got you just pick them because you can't have enough good players. Um, but you certainly need to keep an eye on, um, and you, they are rated in your list, though, but you need to keep an eye on areas of the ground. And, and I suppose Harrison Petty is an example of that. Like, we've got, um, you know, uh, levers just come in, also, we've got Oscar McDonald Frost, um, and Tommy's played back there in the past. Um, Declan Kelly on the rookie list. 
So you wouldn't say comparatively that we're it's an absolute need, but we, we rated Harry, and um, at that point in the draft, we thought he was the next in line anyway, but we, we thought that that's a good selection for the footy club to yeah. shore up our key defensive stocks going forward. So there is some thought about it. Like, look, we... We're of the opinion through our discussions that, you know, we need to want to add another small forward. Um, you know, with some real grunt and likes to tackle. And so we had a number of those players that we, we, you know, effectively could have rated a fraction higher because of need basis, but we we're also attracted to what they did, could deliver as a player. Um, as far as the um, final decision, uh, look, I think the greatest thing about our footy club at the moment is transparency. So, we speak um, daily, if not, you know, certainly towards the latter month heading towards the draft with Simon and, and all the coaches have an input and we discuss it and it's a really strong group decision really but ultimately, uh, you know, that's my job description. Someone's got to make the final decision. Simon's uh, the most supportive um, person I've come across in that sense. Or he backs us into the hill. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, we know that uh, competitiveness is highly valued by Simon and the football department. Uh, but in addition to talent, uh, what other attributes are you looking for in a draftee? Uh, how many times do you interview prospective recruits? And uh, do you have to scrutinise stuff like their social media accounts these days as well? Yeah, um, so the first part of that was um, obviously competitiveness is critical um, yep. in any elite sport. Um and you know, we, we we like them to have a certain amount of resilience because it's a it's a hard job. Um, you know, they they're under pressure daily. You know, and they're competing against their teammates, and um, you know, it's their job, and it's it's hard. It's hard physically. It's hard mentally, and it's demanding. So they've got to have a real uh, certain resilience about them, and you know, and and good strong uh, origin that team team ethic there ability to want to play your role for the team and that's not for everyone you know some talented players aren't aren't interested in that so um as far as the interview process goes you know typically we've interviewed early in the year um you know that varies but um if we're satisfied um you know one interview can be enough and then or we may go back and and then talk um with, with, with the player and their families um but I think we then just do some research behind the scenes, um, and then as you get closer to the draft, we have the you know the site profiling, and we collect all that together, and then also the medical information we collect all that together, and and then um, you know you, you you speak to people who have been involved with their their lives um, for a long time, and and uh, you know you start getting a common theme one way or another. Um, but as far as the social media stuff, yeah, we do have a little bit of a look at a bit there. Those things tend to rear their head for you um, as well. But, yeah, there's a lot of research that goes into it. But I, I'm not a um, – oh, we don't interview to put them under the pump. No. Um, that's not my style. And um, I don't think you actually get the real person when you're doing that with them because you, you can't draw the information that you need out of them. Is it harder to pick the right talent at the pointy end of the draft or find a diamond in the rough um, back down the order a bit? Um, is it harder to pick it at the top or is it easier at the back? Um, oh, look, I think that um, the, 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 whether you can, it's easy to find them at the back, that just depends if... Um, it can be easier to get them at a certain point because through that intel you might know that you're really the only ones that have spoken to them. Um, yep. So you might have rated them a bit higher, but you might take them you know, out a bit because you've just got strong intel that says, well, I haven't spoken to anyone else. You know? So, um, yep. so that, that gives you, I suppose, a, 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 um, a fair idea. But um, all those... Um, you know, early selections is, is look. I, I think every selection is critical, and that's that's the reality of it. Early selections are obviously highly scrutinised, and they are critical because they can give you that elite talent. Um, so you've got to do an enormous amount of work on them. Um, if you if you've got that blue chip pick, you've got to make sure you you get it right because they're all young men and they all have their flaws. 
So next year is uh, reportedly, uh, you know, the super draft, as we're hearing. Um, how keen are, are the, the Ds to work its way back into the first round uh, for that, and how much influence do you have in the football department to engineer that outcome? Yeah, well, I'm, on, I'm part of list management, so they're ongoing discussions, but um, you just got to get into game mode and see, see who's performing and improving and... and um, you know, that can be dictated to by um, opportunities out in control, you know, in the marketplace. But as far as the super draft, well, I'm up in Darwin at the moment. You know, obviously there's some really talented young players in this academy group. Um, but I, I don't subscribe to the super draft as such. I think that each draft, um, I think we can tend to fall in love with the 17 year olds because we're not picking the eyes out of them. And each draft ends up having some really quality players at the top. And it, it, 2018 will be the same, but um, I think the draft that's just gone had some really quality players at the top as well. Yeah. Um, Jason, thanks very much for your time. We've got a couple more for you, if you can just yeah, hang no around for a couple no, more fine. minutes. Some time, um, yeah. Jeff Farmer has a teenage son, Kobe, um, yeah. who looks to have a bit of talent. Are we keeping yeah. an eye on the young wizard? And uh, are there any other potential father-son prospects out there at the moment? Cody Bearing in mind, Jake Lovett's been around, sort of yeah. around the mark yeah. for the past couple of years too. Yeah, yeah. Kobe's a bit be the main one at the moment. Um, he's obviously still very young, and you know, you tend, um, you know, not not to um, in the state, you tend not to put too much extra pressure on him at the moment, but. Um, you know, the club will obviously be mindful of that and um, at the right stage, which will be sooner rather than later, we'll start to um, engage a bit more there. Um, we need to uh, congratulate you and thank you for bringing um, uh, Clayton Oliver to the club, um, a best and fairest in his second year um, after a stellar debut year. Um, how does uh, he rate in terms of the elite young talent you've seen in all your time uh, being in the game and uh, at what point did you determine uh, that we needed to target him and secure uh, the high pick uh, necessary uh, to, to get him? Yeah, look, I think we, um, I've been on record in the past that, you know, we identified Clayton early in the year um, and he wasn't in the greatest condition because he'd had some injuries through the pre-season. Um, so I suppose he didn't, he, he didn't look the part at that time, but he certainly did some stuff that we see now. And then um, as his year got rolling on, I went and watched him in both his VFL games for Richmond and... Um, he appeared in those games to be the standout player for AFL attributes. Um, and so pretty much from there, we were pretty keen. Um, and then we just, you know, uh, did the work on him as we would any player from then on. And, um, you know, the interview process and, and all that through the combine as well. It was a home interview up in and, um And then also at the family home and, so we, we did a fair bit of work on it, obviously being an early pick. Um, and we just thought we'd orchestrate that trade to, as a, you know, I think I've been on record, to get, to get some uh, early picks in and get going again, you know what I mean? Like get the players in 12 months earlier and Sam Wiedemann was part of that. And we know Sam's going to take a bit of time as a, as a key forward. The tall stay will take a little bit longer and that's just the reality of it. If you look back through history. Um, so... Um, as far as, yeah, I'm not going to be speaking about, you know, pumping Clayton up too much, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but he's obviously got some, you know, footy, footy talent and he's a competitive animal. Uh, he is indeed. A question about the tap cup. Um, yeah. Does the style of play, given that it's, you know, so open and free, does that make it difficult to, to make judgments on the players? Um, and how they're going to perform in an AFL environment where the contest is so much more an issue? Yeah, not for me. Um, I think that it's been spoken of, um, and I can understand some of that relevance, but I I think the way we look at a player that, yeah, you just got to look at what you're looking, you know, the specifics of what you like in a, in a player, and it doesn't really matter the circumstances of the, the game. I'm typically not one to follow styles of play. Um, I'm typically not one that knows the score. Um, it's more about watching the player go about their business uh, in a game and how they perform under pressure and um, how competitive they want to, they want to be. Yep. 
Um, so there's, there's always yeah. things you'd like to change in, in a lot of things, but I think you just got to um, put your nose down, just work within the parameters you're given, and that way you'll get the job done. Um, Corey Maynard and Joel Smith uh, are both showing plenty of promise. Uh, are you tracking other Category B rookies uh, on the back of that? Well, we have, and we and some we haven't gone with, or we haven't um, got anyone specific right at the moment. But that's always something that we're you know looking at and keeping in mind. And um, you know, but we've been pleased. I was disappointing when Joel got injured. I thought at the start of last year he would have played you know a few of the senior footy, hopefully. But um, yeah, and Corey, um, you can't ask much more for. Um, someone who just attacks the program like no other, really, Corey. So that's why we'll give himself half a chance. Excellent. Well, uh, Jason, we just want to thank you so much uh, for giving us uh, some time uh, to talk to you tonight. Um, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. All right, that's a pleasure, guys. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you. Uh, we will. Good luck for the year. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah, go the days. Go the Bye. days. Thanks, Jason.